I'd like to read to you, uh, it will appear to be lengthy, but it is so very important because it will introduce beautifully our topic for today. The story is retold by Pastor Stephen Cole, and he tells it like this. That fateful week began and progressed as normal for the majority of Christendom. Oh, this week was quite different, but only a few Christians would notice, far too few. One pastor arose early on Sunday to review the sermon he had prepared. He would begin his three-point evangelistic message with a funny story. Then he would include a few Bible verses, the quote from Time magazine, and a story about a dramatic conversion. And, of course, he would conclude with an emotional appeal to come forward and to make a decision. Yes, he thought, this one has been planned perfectly. It ought to produce great results. As he reread the sermon for the last time, it was obvious that he didn't notice the difference. Sunday morning service throughout the country went exactly as planned. Each sanctuary was full of smiling, well-dressed Christians. The services began with the doxology, prayer, announcements, a couple of hymns, and special music during the offering. Although the hymns sounded rather dead, it was no worse than usual. In fact, people responded to the minister's pleas, and the offerings were larger than usual. Even the invitations were a success. As the congregation finished the third verse of Just As I Am, many came forward for rededication, salvation, or church membership. As the people filed out the door to get home in time for the football game on TV, it was obvious that none of them had noticed the difference. The week continued on flawlessly. The banquet Tuesday night was a huge success as the church raised enough pledges for the down payment on the new sanctuary. The Wednesday evening prayer meeting also went as usual. The few who came prayed that God would bless all the missionaries. For the Friday night high school social, the youth pastor had come up with some crazy new games that made it a roaring success, but no one noticed the difference. A few church members even got to witness at work that week. Rick, for example, had been feeling guilty about not talking to Don. So at lunch, he took a deep breath, pulled out a booklet from his pocket, and read the laws to Don. Although Don didn't seem very interested, Rick plowed through the entire presentation. He left the booklet with Don and encouraged him to pray the prayer at the end to invite Christ into his heart. Rick felt a sense of relief that he had finally shared the laws. But Rick didn't notice. In fact, few Christians would have noticed, even in an entire year. <clears throat> but there were a few Christians who had a most frustrating week. One pastor sat and stared at his Bible, but couldn't get anything out of it. He knew the Bible, and he knew how to prepare biblical sermons. But the Bible had become a dead book to him. He was frustrated and perplexed. He noticed the difference. Other believers also noticed. One man kept succumbing to lusting after an attractive woman at work. He couldn't get the victory no matter how hard he tried. Another man angrily snapped at his wife and yelled at his kids. When he felt a twinge of guilt, he justified himself by blaming them for being insensitive to his needs. A small group that normally was overflowing with joy in the Lord and love for one another found themselves depressed and bickering. Several other Christians found themselves doubting their salvation, even wondering if God existed. These believers were defeated, frustrated, and confused, but they definitely noticed the difference. When those at the church who had experienced a normal week heard about those who were having trouble, they weren't surprised. They knew that something like this would happen sooner or later. They knew that these other Christians were just too radical. Those who, whose week had gone well smugly thought 
it serves those fanatics right. You can't be excited about Jesus week in and week out. What was there to notice as difference, different about this week? God decided to see which Christians were living in dependence on his Holy Spirit and which ones were just depending on their own intellect and human plans to live the Christian life. So he completely withdrew his Holy Spirit from the earth for the entire week. Think about it. Would you have noticed the difference? When I read that, I thought to myself, oh my, I have been the preacher in that story. I have been the Christian in that story. It is very easy to feel like we have too much going on to pray and to present ourselves to the Lord, especially on a daily basis. I was talking to someone not so long ago, and we were talking about what, do you, what are you tempted with the older you get. Surely, one of the benefits of being a Christian for most of your life is that it would surely get easier. Anybody want to testify that it gets easier? My testimony is it gets even perhaps harder. There's more at stake Nobody wants to quit the race with only two laps to go. What makes it so hard? Well, it's our very nature. We're told that within us there is a weakness. It's more than that. It is a wickedness. It's the sin nature that all of us possess. And out there, there is the world with all of the temptations it offers. And on occasion, even perhaps Satan himself or those who are aligned with him would be involved with tempting us and trying us, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Let me assure you that it does not matter how much you know. It does not matter how many good experiences you've had in the Lord. It does not matter how old you are. The flesh is always just a little bit stronger than your good intentions, than your determination, than your new promises. That is why it was such a big deal for these people, indeed why it is such a big deal for us, that we have been given God's Holy Spirit. That he is here to lead us, to empower us, to teach us, and that brings us to our text today. It's found in Acts chapter 16, verses 6 through 11. You'll find those on you, those notes that have been handed out. In the bold print will be our text from the book of Acts. Can anybody tell the difference? I have to admit to you, I mean, I don't like to. I'd like to tell you that I've really arrived, that I'm just kind of coasting through spirituality. But I am reminded day after day, sometimes seemingly moment after moment, that all that is within me is too, is just too weak to deal with all of the temptations that come at me. And that's why it is so important for us to know and understand what God's Holy Spirit wants to do. Well, let's take a look at our text here from that same author, Stephen Cole, that says this, one of the main lessons of the book of Acts is that the expansion of the early church was due to the working of the Holy Spirit. He was directing, moving, and empowering the apostles as they responded to his leading. If we want to see God working today in a similar fashion, we need to fight routine Christianity, mark that if you would, routine Christianity, and rather seek daily to submit and to follow the sovereign spirit. The message of our text is, since the Holy Spirit is sovereign over his work, we must seek to follow him as we labor for the Lord. I like the way he introduced the word sovereign. Sovereign is a nice combination of root words in Latin that means to rule over. 
to have authority over. And indeed, that is what we have with the ministry of the Holy Spirit. You remember back in the book of John where he wrote the story how Jesus said, now I'm going to go. And it's really a good thing for me to go because when I go, there will be another one who comes. And he will be the Holy Spirit. In the Bible, he's referred to as God's Holy Spirit, as the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus. Of course, I, we don't pretend to fully understand how it all put is put together in the Bible, but it's clearly presented that there is one God, and yet the Bible speaks of there being uh, a, a, a personality of a trinity. There is God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, we'll explain that on another day. Right. Like I'm going to explain the trinity to you on another day. But we'll discuss it on another day. But right now, we need to understand that God has given to us this incredible gift. Remember the big deal that it was when those 120 disciples were in the upper room and all of a sudden they experienced the fullness, the presence of God's Holy Spirit. Do you remember what a big deal it was when Peter went and those Samaritans received the Holy Spirit and how the church rejoiced when Cornelius, a pagan Roman far from Jerusalem, he and his household received the Holy Spirit. When they had their big conference in Jerusalem, James got up and he says, listen, the main information that you need to have is this, that God has given his Holy Spirit to the Gentiles. We've got to find a way to live together. So let's begin. The sovereign Holy Spirit leads us to the right partners. Now, why didn't I say people? That would mean essentially the same. But I think it's important for us to put the word partners in there because all of us have been given that great commission that we have been commissioned by Christ to go into the world, and as we go, everywhere we go, with every opportunity that the Holy Spirit gives us, we testify to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died for sinners, was buried and raised on the third day, and is now in heaven awaiting the day of his return. What good news that is. We are need partners in this ministry of reconciliation. The Lord will bring people into our lives that will encourage us in this matter of the Great Commission. We see that happening with Paul. So let's read the verses here, a couple that we read from last week. It says, Paul went first to Derby and then to Lystra, where there was a young disciple named Timothy. We introduced him to everybody last week. Timothy is in his late teens, maybe his early 20s at this time. Says his mother was a Jewish believer, but his father was a Greek. Timothy was well thought of by the believers in Lystra and Iconium. So Paul wanted him to join them on their journey. Skipping down to the last verse of our passage, chapter 16, verse 10. It says, so we decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling us to preach the good news there. Now, let's think, who is writing the book of Luke? I mean, the book of Acts? Duh, of course, you know the answer now. It's Luke. Luke is a physician. In the story, he is telling the, 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 the travels of Peter and Philip, and now Paul and Barnabas and Silas from that third person perspective. This is what they did. These are the things that happened. But now all of a sudden, Luke, when he writes, he says, this is what we found and this is where we went. So we're going to see that now there's a third person added to this, this trip. There's Paul and Silas as the, the first team. And now added to that team would be a second person, Timothy, and this third person equaling 
four in total, Dr. Luke. So here we find Paul preparing for what will be perhaps the most difficult of his journeys. He's going to go 2,800 miles. We'll see here in a little bit there's some indication that he's having some really serious issues with his, with his health. Now you think about it. I forgot to take my sinus medicine today. So you'll notice if you're here for both services, my head will just start to fill by about 1130. I'll be sounding like this. I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> All right. I take a, a naproxen every night before I go to bed because it just helps me sleep better. You know, all the parts don't twist as well as they used to. Think about all the medication that you take and what happens when you can't take it anymore. Now, imagine living in a time where it was always either too hot or too cold, too dry or too wet, and you don't have any of your medication. How well would you be moving in your 40s and 50s? Luke was not a, a, a physician by our standard. If we saw the kinds of things he did, we would think he's just barely above a witch doctor. He doesn't understand anything, but nonetheless, he understood much more than most people. So the help that he could give Paul was limited. And Paul, we know, had a number of physical issues that were given to him because of the persecution, the hardness of the journey. But there were also some real health issues that he dealt with. We'll get back to that in a little bit. So now we find these partners brought to Paul so that he might accomplish the Great Commission. The Lord gave him Silas. The Lord gave him Timothy, his son in the faith. The Lord gave him a personal physician who was also a very competent preacher and church leader. So the sovereign Holy Spirit leads us to the right partners. That's why it's so important that we connect to a church because what we do when we come to a church and we make ourselves a part of that church is we commit to partner with these people to preach the gospel of Christ here in our own Jerusalem and then everywhere until we reach the farthest corners of the earth. Number two, the sovereign Holy Spirit leads us to the right places. I did not want to put this in the notes because it just sounds rather crass, but it really is the best way to describe it. You've been there. You just get this feeling that something isn't right. You shouldn't go. You, you shouldn't be involved in that. This isn't the right time. And sometimes you'll say, I just don't know. I have a feeling. But if you're a guy, maybe you would say it like this. I just had this gut feeling. I mean, it's just, it's way down and deep, and you're not really sure how to describe it. You're not even really sure where that feeling comes from, where that, that thought comes from, but you know that it just doesn't feel right. Well, I know by personal experience, and more importantly, by what we have seen as, as taught in the scriptures is this, that there are times when God will use our sanctified gut to lead us this way or that, to hinder us from going there or to keep us from doing that. The Holy Spirit lives within us so that he might not only empower us to do God's will, but that he also would teach us the word of God, but that he would also instruct us in where we should go, lead us in our day-by-day-by-day -by -day -by -day experience. Think about it. What an incredible privilege it is to know that we can get up on every morning and say, yes, Lord, I will, I will commit myself at the beginning of this day to do your will. I am asking that your Holy Spirit would empower me, 
that he would teach me, that he would convict me, that he would take me and, and give me the words to say. And like you, I don't claim for it to be a personal experience of me only, but how many times have you been just going through your day and all of a sudden you feel that heavy hand on your shoulder? Not physically. When we were kids, and I think maybe my kids might remember this as well, probably all kids do, you're wiggling and squirming in church. That happens a lot, doesn't it? And if we were in church and there was a time when we were young and my dad went to church with us, if we felt his hand on our leg, all of the movement just went right out of us. We sat still. If we were horsing around and we felt a hand on our shoulder with a little bit of a squeeze, you know that feeling. I mean, we straightened right up because we knew we had been caught. There are times, I fear too many times, but nonetheless, when I have felt the heavy hand of God's Holy Spirit on my shoulder or on my leg, and he says in the course of the day, what do you think you're doing? It's time for you to straighten right up. What a privilege it is to know that the Holy Spirit walks with us throughout the day, leading us not only to the right partners, but also to the right places. You've had the experience where you've been at just the right place because something happened and you were there and you were able to really encourage somebody. And if you were telling it afterwards, perhaps you said it like this, I really can't explain it. It was just a God thing. Meaning, I'm just certain it was God that ordered the steps. Well, let's take a look at the verses found in Acts chapter 16. It says, Next Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phy uh, Phygia in Gal Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia at that time might want to mark, mark the word, had prevented them. Then coming to the borders of Mysia, they headed north for the province of Bethania. But again, the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them, underline that, to go there. So instead, they went on through Mysia to the seaport of Troas. That reminds me of this great verse that we use often from Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. But we can make our plans, but the Lord determines our steps. Here, Paul's intentions were as good as gold. He wanted to preach the gospel everywhere. He says that looks like the logical place to go. That's the most sensible place to establish the next ministry. And then as he started that way, it was obvious to him and to the rest of the team that that was not God's plan. Now, I don't know what happened. Really, none of us do. Some people think, well, perhaps the Lord spoke to Paul. That could have happened. We really can't tell the Lord what he can and can't do. Others said, no, no, I bet the circumstances were such that he just, every time he tried to go that way, there was a roadblock, and it was a roadblock that God put in place. And that could have been the case, and maybe it was both of those things. There are many who say because of Luke's participation in this ministry team now that Paul had a serious medical issue. Because it seems to be after this that he begins to make references to his thorn of the flesh and the difficulties he's had with his physical well-being. So perhaps that was part of it. Whatever it was, after it happened, time and time and time again, they decided, you know what? It's not a matter of being faithful and determined. Now it's a matter of listening carefully to what the Spirit is saying. And the Spirit is telling us not to go that direction. Sometimes our stubbornness puts us in a place where we are out from under the protection of God's authority. 
we have to be very careful that we understand that he can move us on that chessboard of ministry any place he wants us to. In fact, you remember how James talked about it. He says, look here, you who say, tomorrow or, or today or tomorrow, we are going to a certain town and we'll stay there a year. We will do business there and make a profit. How do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like the morning fog. It's here a little while, then it's gone. What you ought to say is, if the Lord wants us to, we will live and do this or that. Otherwise, you are boasting about your own pretentious plans, and all such boasting is evil. There's a real important principle here that we have the peace of God as we begin to move in certain directions. Now, that's really vague. I mean, how do you define that? How do you identify that? And it's a little bit difficult to put into words, but we know this. You have been there, I'm guessing, when you know this just isn't the right place. This isn't the right time. This isn't the right determination in my life. I just don't feel good about it. I don't think that it's God who's giving me the peace. It's not my worry. It's not my tendency. It's not my personality. No, I have a sanctified gut feeling that I shouldn't do this. Now, it's the other way as well. How many times have you thought to yourself, I ought to go over and talk to so-and-so. I ought to go and do this. I should give some money to this person. I need to ask this person if everything is all right. And then you, you convince yourself for a while, that just isn't, that's none of my business. I don't, I shouldn't be worrying about that. What would they think? They're going to think I'm nuts. What? And on and on. But when you know that it's something from the outside that keeps speaking to you, speaking to you rather, and keeps motivating you, then assume that it's the Holy Spirit. And take that step of faith and see where the next step leads. The sovereign Holy Spirit will lead us to the right partners in this great work of the Great Commission. The sovereign Holy Spirit will move us to the right places. Thirdly, the sovereign Holy Spirit leads us to the right priority. We've spoken of the Great Commission, and now we highlight it. There in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, it says, Do not stifle the Holy Spirit. Do not scoff at prophecies, but test everything that is said. Hold on to what is good. Stay away from every kind of evil. Now, I'm not asking you to get in touch with your feelings. What I'm saying is this. If it's your determination to serve the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're reading the word, if you know that sin in your life has been cared for, you're walking as much as you know in the righteousness that Christ gives to us. And then... The Lord seems to lean one way or the other. You follow the leading. Because all of it involves this great commission that Christ has given to us. Our text says in verse 9 of chapter 16, That night Paul had a vision. A man from Macedonia in northern Greece was standing there pleading with him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. So they decided to leave for Macedonia at once, having concluded that God was calling them to preach the good news there. Now, why God does things the way he does them, I don't know. That's really his business. Our, our business is to salute and to follow in obedience. But Paul, in this act of obedience, responding to the leading of the Holy Spirit, went this direction instead of that direction, and in so doing, took the gospel into Europe. Ultimately, that's where it would go.
And there the gospel would go into Europe and there it would prosper. And then it would spill out over into this great land of the United States. This moment in history is very important to us as American Christians because the Holy Spirit took the gospel thrust and turned it towards our direction. Why did he do that? Well, that's for God to decide and to explain in his own time and way. But this much we know. What was being done in this story was so that the most important thing would stay the most important thing. And that is reaching the world with the gospel of Christ. Acts chapter 1-8 is how it all started. Christ said, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere. In Jerusalem, through Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. None of those men and women who were there and heard those words had any thought of going anywhere beyond Israel. That's all they wanted, was the Lord to do something special for his people in the land of Israel. And when the persecutions came and the Spirit led and when he empowered, all of a sudden now, within about 25 years, the gospel is literally headed towards every corner of the known world. No organization could have planned this. This was the work of the sovereign Holy Spirit. Would you close your eyes and bow your heads, please? When I read that story that I shared with you, I really felt quite convicted. I thought, how many days have there been when I have done all of the things that are required of me, that I, but I've done it without the empowering of God's Holy Spirit? I wasn't going through the motion. I mean, my heart was in the right place and that I wanted to do God's will. I guess I just wanted to do God's will my own way. What do you call that? I'm afraid we call that disobedience, don't we? I can't get the words right to any song I sing, but this is one that I sing repeatedly to myself. You've heard me try on a number of occasions to sing it, and I'll sing it one more time because it is a great prayer for the start of every day. It is a great closing prayer for our service today. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, to your will and to your way. I'll say yes, Lord, yes, I will trust you and obey. When your spirit speaks to me, with my whole heart I'll agree. And my answer will be yes. Lord, yes. Father, you know how many times we've failed. We're not here to rehearse that. Father, but you know how much we want to see you accomplish. And Lord, we want to see it done in such a way that the Lord Jesus is lifted up. Lord, that it's done in such a way that you receive all the glory. And Father, I know in order for that to take place, in all of the little areas of life and, and to, to see it accomplished in the big areas of life, like the sharing of the gospel to the far places of this world. Lord, that it needs to be the work that your Holy Spirit does in and then through us. Lord, remind us this week of how important it is to be surrendered, to be filled. Lord, we want this week to be different than last week. We want to see you accomplish more this week than we've ever seen before. And Father, we know that's your plan and that's your desire if we surrendered moment by moment to that wonderful Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Father, I ask for this as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for your good attention today. I appreciate that.